Welcome to another Sales Hacker webinar. Uh, very excited for this one. Um, the topic we're going to be talking about, something near and dear to uh, my heart for sure, uh, having led uh, sales development teams in the past, and it's how to get the most out of your sales development team in 2019. Uh, a lot of us right now are going through our you know, FY19 planning. Uh, I know we currently are uh, this, this week. Uh, and we're going to be talking about, you know, a new playbook for a new year. There's new strategies out there. What should people be thinking about? And I have some pretty amazing guests uh, with me. But before I introduce them, uh, I do want to just do some super quick housekeeping matters. So number one, uh, if you have joined us before on a Sales Hacker webinar, uh, you know that these are recorded. So we will be sending it, this out to you as soon as we wrap up. So if you have to jump off uh, and close a deal uh, or open a deal, um, please do so uh, and uh, we'll send this as we wrap up. And number two, uh, we want this to be super interactive. So we've got a little bit of a deck to kind of set the stage uh, and then we're just going to be having kind of a Q&A banter back and forth. So please do jump on the Q&A, introduce yourself. Uh, let us know what company you work for, what your title is, and uh, any relevant questions that you have uh, throughout. We do want to hear from you. This webinar is for the community. All right. So we got that out of the way. Um, I am joined by two very special guests, uh, one of which whose book basically taught me everything I needed to know as a sales development rep, uh, and that is Trish Bertuzzi. Um, so Trish Bertuzzi, welcome. Thank you. And uh, also uh, Adam Sh Schoenfield, I should have asked you this before we were on a live webinar. How do I pronounce your last name correctly? Good enough, Schoenfeld. You're good enough, Schoenfeld. Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> awesome. Well, Adam, welcome, man. And so I always like to add a little bit more color. Um, I'm sure a lot of people have seen both of your faces uh, before. Uh, so quickly, Trish, uh, Trish Bertuzzi is the best-selling author of the Sales Development Playbook, uh, truly one of my favorite sales books out there, and the founder of The Bridge Group. Uh, so she and her team have worked with over 380 plus B2B technology companies. That's a lot. Uh, okay. Helping them to, <laughs> it's quite a few, helping them to unleash the power of sales development, inside sales, and also customer success. So they're really on a mission, you were saying, to help companies build repeatable pipeline and strategies. Yep. Pretty. <laughs> That's awesome. And uh, also, Adam. So Adam is the VP of at where on product strategy and product marketing and Previous to that, you were actually the former CEO of uh, Sifrock, uh, which was acquired by Drift. And you kind of became a little bit LinkedIn famous uh, because you decided to go and be an SDR. Was it for an entire month? Two months. Two months. Two months. Wow. Commitment. So commitment. we'll dive into that. Yeah. That is commitment. That is definitely, definitely commitment. Um, so I want to dive into that for sure uh, a little bit, uh, probably a little bit later, but let's, let's dive right into it. I feel like I've done enough talking already. Um, so Trish, I'm going to start with you on this one okay. and just talk about what are some of the big trends that you're seeing in sales development as we head into 2019. So I don't want to kind of take away from some of the data we're going to share with the audience in a little bit in the deck, but um, let me yeah. set the stage for it because I think there's a couple Please. of big trends. The first big trend is that we're at the next level of getting our buyers to engage with us, right? I talk about it all the time. Buyers have built this big wall between them and us and they have done it because we bore the crap out of them. Everyone talks about personalization, how do you do personalization at scale? So we've got the messaging part of it down, but now we have to get to the point where we figure out the media or medium, whichever word you choose. Like how does Scott versus Adam versus Trish versus whomever want to receive information? Is it video? Is it 
phone? Is it email? And I think based on our research, it does fall into specific categories based on buyer types. That's the new frontier. Right. All sequences moving forward are going to not just be about number of touches, voicemail, email, whatever. It's going to be based on the media that the buyer is most comfortable receiving information in. That's number one. Number two is the return of ROI. For years, sales development, right, we just throw money at it, especially if you're a VC-funded company. Go one-to-one, -one, do whatever, buy the market. Well, you know, those days are kind of heading out the door and people are starting to think yeah. about ROI again. If I'm going to make this level of investment and it is a significant investment, am I going to get my money's worth? So once again, those are the two big trends that we're paying attention to here. Love it. So kind of this, this increase in omni-channel approach and then a heavy, heavy focus on the ROI. There's no more buying growth. You can't just, you know, get 20 SDRs and, and have their way. Um, you need to be steadily tracking the ROI of each level of your investment. Yeah, it's a shift. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so Adam, are you going to share the deck or do you want me to share this uh, deck? Why don't you go ahead and share it? Okay, let me see here. Uh, yeah, and I, what, what Trish is saying totally resonates with me. You know, we've thought a lot about this at Drift, which is just the shift. All these shifts are driven by the buyer, right? And how they want to engage and what they expect. Um, and so I think it's, it's interesting. I think we've been in a little bit of a heyday with Outbound over the last three, four, five years, right? And where vendors have been able to control the conversation a lot. And I think definitely what... I'm seeing, um, and, and Trisha's comments really on it for me is if, if they weren't already now, then the, the buyers definitely feel like they're in control um, more and have more choice and, and the bar is being raised in terms of how we actually get their attention. Exactly. And we have to be innovative, creative, do it on their time. That's another thing that we forget about a lot you know our SDRs work a certain set of hours our communications are scheduled go a certain set of times like self-serve education is huge right that's going to be huge for people who want to educate their buyers further and setting up that self-serve category I think is going to be really important absolutely all right are you guys seeing that yeah. getting there are we seeing the full full screen here no on your set? No. Okay. Oh, nope. Bear with me, people. Live webinars. Here we go. Uh, view Doing it live. And Doing it live. All right. Here we are. Perfect. So uh, let's, let's dive into this. So Trish, you mentioned okay. this uh, kind of in the the prelude uh, to what we, we were talking about. So how will uh, the ROI of sales development come into focus in, in 2019? All right. So if you go to the next slide, I'll kind of talk about the way we've thought about it in the past and where I see us going in the future. So when companies have come to us and they're like, we're thinking about how to really measure our ROI for this team. And there's got to be certain levers we can pull. They've been pretty traditional levers. There's one location. People talk about it all day, every day on LinkedIn and on Martin Sales Pros and on Sales Hacker Group, you name it. They are saying, hey, I have a team in the Bay Area. It's killing me. Those kind of expenses. Where should I go next? Should I go to... Scottsdale, should I go to Tampa? Should I go to Denver? Where should I go? That's always uh, something that people have looked at. And I think it's pretty much the norm now where people might have multi locations for their sales development teams. The yeah. other lever they would look at would be the ratio of SDRs to AEs. Those people who were throwing money at this scenario were a lot of them were buying at one, one to one, one SDR to one AE. Okay. Does that math work? Rarely, if ever. But you know what? If you're trying to ramp pump pipeline real quick, you're trying to get something going, you don't mind what your CAC looks like, sure, you could go there. Um, and expanding it further, I think the average on our research is 1 to 3.4 or something. It's one thing to look at. Other yeah. things to look at is ramp. If it takes 3.4 months for an SDR to get ramped and I cut it down to two months, more productivity. If I get them to stay longer because I implement micro promotions or whatever the case may be, 
I get them to stay longer? And what other tools can I use to get productivity up? So those are what everybody used to look at, right? Those leadership levers. What, yeah. Where we're going now is the smart companies are starting to look at what's on the right side. What is my SDR cost? And people define costs very differently. Does it include marketing? You know, you, overhead, you got to figure that out on your own. I'm not here to tell you how to define that. But what are our SDR costs as a percentage of revenue, as a percentage of profit, which is even more important, actually, and as a percentage of sales and marketing expense? How does that all tie together to revenue? So we're actually starting to look at numbers again and not just levers. Yeah. That's where I see people going. That makes total sense. And Trish, I don't know, do you have any kind of baselines for, for what people should be operating, operating at as like an SDR cost per, you know, per, per profit, per dollar so, amount of profit? Yeah. So here's the thing, just like in everything else, and I, I say this every time someone asks me a benchmarking question because we do benchmarking, but there are a yeah. whole set of variables that impact that your sales cycle, right. your deal size, your marketing expense, your brand in the marketplace. So no, I'm not saying that there is a specific number you should shoot for, but to start, you need to know what your numbers are and very few people do. And then from there, right. you know, you figure out what's my goal and where do I want to get to? Yeah. Like, you know, something funky's going on here, right? Yeah, just switching okay. it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. That makes right. that makes sense. Sorry, it's it's I usually don't share the deck, so it's difficult to do the, the chat okay. as well. But um oh, so Adam, sorry. any yeah. that's all right. Any um any thoughts on this, Adam, from from your perspective? Is this thing are these measures things that you're already actively looking at at drift, or are you still more kind of on the left hand side right now? We're probably uh, a little bit in between at Drift. I think we're, we're newer to building outbound, um, but I think we want to get ahead of this and look at, you know, all of it. Um, Cause I definitely agree with Trish, like on where it's going and like all the people I've talked to while being an SDR and all the like SDR managers I trade notes with um, along the way, um, there definitely mm -hmm. is a greater focus on these financial measures. Um, and I think, uh, I think Max has had some great content on, like the AE SDR industrial complex and just mm -hmm. how to think about the sort of financial side of that and relative to your ACV and your TAM. And I think, you know, because probably per activity, we're all getting a little bit less return. I think that's driven folks to put a little finer point on the actual financial model behind this team, rather than just like Trish was saying, just like kind of go ham with hiring SDRs. Yep. That makes sense. And just for uh, the community sake, when did uh, Drift start building out their outbound team? How, how new is new? Well, we've had a few for a while. I'm not sure um, when that started, probably about a year. Um, and we're now, we're now ramping it up as we've gotten um, smarter about how we segment our business and think about for our higher ACV lines of business, having a, a, a bigger focus on our outbound motion. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, all right, so this brings us to uh, our, our next kind of slide here. Uh, and Trish, why don't you walk us through um, some of the kind of desired communication methods? Because this was pulled from a, a survey that uh, Sales Hacker and Bridge Group uh, collaborated on, correct? Yeah, this is actually a great piece of research. It's called the Ultimate Buyer Engagement Guide. And it was um, a research project we did, Bridge Group did with Sales Hacker and Modern Sales Pros. Mm -hmm. So we got fabulous responses. And there's a lot of great information there. Um, I'm sure you, it's on the Sales Hacker resources page uh, where you can download. But I wanted to share this one because I thought it was re just to sort of re-articulate the, the differences and how different roles care about how to be communicated with. Like if you look at this slide, marketing loves email, right? Loves email at 50%, sales at 33%, loves phone calls at 9%, while sales says phone calls at 22%, like swag way better, 
Um, I mean, it's just really interesting. If you really take a deep dive in your buyer personas and here's a concept, you can ask them and they'll tell you how they want to be communicated with, then um, you can build your sequences um, or your cadences to reflect the desire, desired communication method of your buyers. So I thought it was super interesting. Like sales loves videos. You know why? We don't read. I'm just going to say it. We don't <laughs> like it. it. takes too much time. Just give me something in a sound yeah. bite, right? So, yeah. you know, I think this is a really, and, and weird thing, marketing likes video hardly at all. Don't you think they would love video? I mean, it's it's a weird thing, but... Once again, you got to look at the data for your buyer personas, and then you're going to build your omni-channel strategy around it. Yeah. I found yeah. this so interesting, Trish, too. I mean, obviously, we all know a lot of sales and marketing people because we're in the echo chamber, but I was also thinking about how yeah. companies could map this to all kinds of different buyers, right? Whether it's CIOs or engineers or VPs of HR, right? Like, it's got to well, be a dramatically yeah. different profile for everybody. Well, you should look um, in the guide. We um, ops IT, I think, was one category. They don't do not talk to us. Like they want do <laughs> not. And you know what, Pete? I'm going to kill his last name. Kaczynski from Modern Sales Pros. Brilliant. Guy. Kajan, Kajansky? Kajansky. Kajansky. It's, it's a it's it's a hard it's a okay. hard last name. Well, shame on me. I talk to him all the time. I should have it down. But he, um, when he summed this up, he's like, look. When you're looking at ops or IT, it's super, it's super simple. They are in a workflow mode. They don't want to be interrupted. So things mm -hmm. that aren't interruptive work for them. I mean, if we really think it through, sales is on the go. Sales want things to deliver things quickly. Marketing's probably sitting in the office. They have more time to read stuff. Like, it's, I thought it was so interesting. This is a great study, and we're going to continue to go down this path with our clients and our research this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, when I first saw this, it just it it was so cool because you could essentially build your cadences set up like this, right? You could have like for if you're selling into salespeople, you could have 33% of your kind of cadence or sequence set up as email, and then 22% phone call, 16% social on LinkedIn, 15% uh, you know video. Uh, yep. So I think it's it's really really cool, and I think. Uh, looking at different personas would be super interesting as well. I think you're right, Adam. I bet if you put like IT folks in here, um, video would maybe, I don't know. We could make speculations, yeah. but it would be interesting to see. Somebody was asking uh, that in the chat. They said, how do you outbound to IT then? What, how does that even work if you can't interrupt the workflow? And, yeah. you know, I was, I was thinking, yeah. about, I'm curious what you think, Trish, but I was thinking, you know, maybe it's that outbound isn't the first way you engage them. Maybe it's a webinar. And then you call them right after the webinar, right? Maybe you have to kind of get mm -hmm. creative with how you do both sales and marketing touches for that persona. Without a doubt. Sort of yeah, without a doubt. Workflow. Yeah. And no. here's the thing. Yeah. We, I just talked a little earlier about self-serve, right? Self-education. They don't want to be interrupted. They want the information on their terms when they can digest it. So... And they also tend to prefer crowdsourced information. So, you know, once again, fabulous guide right here available for anyone Boom. who wants to take a deep dive. Yeah. We'll actually, if, if you stay to the end, we'll actually uh, send the digital copy out to you um, as we, as we wrap up this webinar. So we'll, uh, yep. we'll send that out. Yep. Um, and so just actually have a clarification question from, uh, from the community. So they just want to be sure this is mean that you're selling into these personas, correct? Yeah, you're selling so this to, is, yes. Yeah. Linda Duchin always asks hard questions. Every time I engage with her, hi Linda, <laughs> yes, you're, these are people we're selling to. Okay, perfect. Yep. All right, moving on here. Um, all right, let's see if the next slide will cooperate. Oh, perfect. So, here is oh the the ne never ending debate hey this kind of cold calling versus social selling two different uh, camps uh, they seem to have very similar arguments which I find funny if you kind of like break it down to like what they're really getting at um, curious Adam what is your response to this debate is there is there one side uh, which way do you lead. I mean, or is it a false choice, is, as the yes. slide says? <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's a false choice, right? I think it's, it goes back to the slide we just looked at, which is what medium will work for your end buyer. 
right? And then starting with that. And then the reality is you probably need to do, you know, probably need to use lots of different mediums and channels and tactics to actually engage your buyer because we don't live in a world where you can just cold call or just prospect on LinkedIn or just send email. It's, it's got to be sort of a multi-channel approach with, with lots of different mediums. That, that's my view. Mm-hmm. You know what, Adam, and you just said something. We don't live in that world. Yeah. Adam, you said <laughs> something really interesting. And I don't know if people translate this. We always talk about social selling, right? Social selling yeah. when it's actually social prospecting. But that's a rant I won't go into right now. But when <laughs> people say it, they mean LinkedIn. That's it. Because yeah. once again, the survey survey says when people talk about social selling, they're only talking about LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, B2C, yes, B2B, not so much. I mean, the data just wasn't there supporting efforts in those areas. Mm-hmm. Sure. I would, yeah, I would I agree with you. Yeah, <laughs> it would be very um, off-putting to get prospected to on Facebook, right? Or yep. there's, there's yeah. some level of acceptance on LinkedIn that if somebody reaches out to you, you may, you may respond. Targeted ads on Facebook, I get, um, yeah. but direct outreach would be creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it all, it, it, there's so much context involved in all of that, right? Like there's, like you said, Trish, there are all these ads for consumer products on Facebook and that's okay. Or Instagram, there's certain things that are okay there, but you know, a B2B buyer of course is going to primarily live on LinkedIn. And uh, Trish, I definitely, definitely agree with you in the, I think social selling is like a complete misnomer that that like needs to be put to rest because it's, it's not, it's really just like social, I don't know, keeping top of mind. That's all you're doing, right? It's just like getting in front of the people you want so that when a conversation can happen, they, they know who to come to. Um, yeah. Is it even, is it, is right. it even social prospecting, I would say, or is it, is it kind of social marketing on more of a one-to-one basis, right? Like the, the best LinkedIn and social engagement seems to be not prospecting at all, but a way to sort of get your attention and build a relationship over a long Exactly. Period. Oh God. Now yeah. we have to think of a whole new word to brand around. <laughs> oh goodness. I don't know well, if I'm smart enough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's well, we, get that going. We've got almost half an hour to figure out the new name. Oh, and, all right. That's awesome. One. Yeah, I can right do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it just comes down to the fact that, you know, the modern seller has to become a marketer now. That's really what you're doing. You're just yeah. marketing yourself humanizing yourself and it's just it's an amazing platform to do so um i think don't confuse that with your your day job though um um, (laughs) you know i think a lot of people use it too much as like a crutch and like they're they're using too much it's it's something that complements everything else that you're doing in my correct correct um all right so more juicy data uh to to dive into uh adam trish who wants to dive into this one I'll start, Adam, because it was our research, but I'd love to get your viewpoint as an SDR and a VP of strategy. So one of the things we asked was, um, how often do people check voicemail? And pretty much it came out, came out to a 5.6 times a week was the average, right? With, you know, variances at other end. So what that means, think about it. If you're checking voicemail once a day, you're listening, you're listening to everybody's voicemail all at once, right? So if you start your voicemail saying, hi, this is John Smith. I'm with Acme Corporate. Delete. Unless they recognize you or your brand. Delete. 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 You have to rise above the noise of that, let's say, 15 to 20 voicemails that person is listening to that day. And if you start with your name and company name, unless you're Salesforce or Microsoft or someone fabulous, you are going to get a delete. That real estate is so precious. I could go on a rant about this, but I'm not going to. My point is you have to rise above the noise because you're in a chain of voicemails that people are listening to. So yeah. figure out how to do that. I don't know about you, Adam, but I almost want to hear that rant. I almost want to hear the rant, <laughs> the voicemail rant. <laughs> we just have a whole webinar on rants because I'm cranky, so yeah. no problem. I could fill an hour. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And I know... Me personally, I would fall into the, you know, almost once per month category. Um, Trish, where do you fall on this? You know, you know, it's so bizarre. 
look at the business I'm in, right? Nobody calls yeah. me. Ever. Nobody ever, ever, ever calls me. Yet I get email up the yaddy hootie. I don't understand <laughs> it. I just don't understand it based on the business I'm in. And it's not like I don't, it's not like I'm not a buyer. I own more software than IBM. I swear to God, I have every technology on the face of the planet. So I'm definitely a buyer. Oh my God. Now I'm going to get a ton of phone calls, aren't I? You're going to get a ton of calls that right after yeah. this. Yeah. That would be awesome. <laughs> I'm open to speaking with you, sales development reps. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, there she is. There's Annie. Annie. You know what, Annie, if you're a good SDR, you can find my phone number because I put it out there publicly. <laughs> you know, Trish, what you were saying about things being sort of reviewed in batch or you have, a, you know, you're getting a bunch of them at a, at a time. It makes me think that pretty much every medium now is that way, right? Like your email inbox, your okay. social feed, like even your iMessage, yeah. your, your voicemail, right? Like that's the mindset that our buyers are in now just in just about any way we can reach them so that idea that you have to rise above that noise and you're just being compared to many many people trying to achieve the same goal with that outreach is i think really important as we go into the new year good there's, point, there's no adam. channel where you're just in a green field yeah. right so adam let me ask you a question you did this amazing stint as um an sdr for two months what was your favorite channel to reach out to people via yeah. So I focused on email and social because that's where mm -hmm. I thought I could learn the fastest. And, and mm -hmm. you know, two months is nothing in this. So we're yeah. starting from a cold start. So I used a lot of email and then I kind of paired it with social. And mm -hmm. I thought that was, um, I really liked the, I liked sending cold emails, um, short, specific, personalized cold emails tended mm -hmm. to work really well for me when I was mm -hmm. doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, but I found it was a pretty good flywheel of taking social proof from LinkedIn and mutual connections and things I saw there and feeding into email and not really prospecting kind of hard on LinkedIn. All right, Scott, can I just keep asking Adam questions? Absolutely. <laughs> <Are you> another... <laughs> please okay. do, please do. So I don't have any luck at all with mutual connections. Yep. I don't have any luck at all. And I have a shit ton, right? Ooh, sorry. Um, I have a That's lot. A so I don't have any luck mentioning them. Oh, look, we have 110 mutual connections and we're both from Boston. Right. Maybe we should... And I don't have any luck when I typically I'll go through and I'll like, all right, all right, Adam, do you know Joe over here? And if yes, here's what I want to talk about. Can you make an intro? And 99% of the time they're like, yeah, I don't know him that well. I'm yeah. just not having any luck with that. Am I right. doing it wrong? Is this is what people I took find? a slightly different tact. So let's say I pulled up a prospect's profile and I saw, you know, Jane and, and me are, are mutually connected to 40 people. And one of them is Matt Hines, who has 20,000 yeah. connections, let's say, or you, Trish, right? Like we probably have thousands of connections in common. I probably wouldn't mention Matt Hines in that because, you know, it's unlikely that it's a close relationship. Yeah. So I kind of flipped it around a little bit and I looked at um, very successful customers. Um, customers who had been quoted or done a case study or G2 crowd review. And I looked at their connections and then I would um, use that in the outreach. Be like, Hey, Trish, looks like, you know, Courtney, she's been a successful customer of Siftrock. Here's what we helped her do. Um, would you be interested in learning more? That was a play that tended to work, but it's small. Like it's, it's one of those things that's I, hard to do, but works well. I'm Smart. an idiot. <laughs> that's going to my next book and I'm taking total credit for that. <laughs> That's Please a, do. Adam, All right. Adam, can you, can you, can you break that like step by step? I think that's genius. And I think there's a lot of SDRs, a lot of BDRs that struggle with that. And Trish, I know exactly where you're coming from. There's so many times when I'll ask a close, you know, basically friend of mine to be like, Hey, you're connected with this person. They'll be like, no idea. Yeah. Don't know. It happens all the time, all the time. So Adam, can you, can you break that down? Like how you actually executed on that? Cause I think it's really actionable and, and an awesome. Yeah. Yeah, so I went about it in two ways. It started, I'll give you the first way that it started, which was, you know, a, pro a prospect, po a task for a prospect pops up for me in outreach. And it's like, okay, I need to reach out to this person today. I pull up their LinkedIn profile. And then I start to notice, hey, this person is connected to an existing customer, right? And I'm like, okay, that's the one I want to use, not the general person that they have, that we both happen to know. Um, yeah. Of course, taking a step back, you need to connect with your customers to make this work, which I think is a good idea in general. But then I would say, okay, <laughs> you are connected to this successful customer and here's how we help them. 
best scenario is we have a quote or a G2 crowd review I can link to, but even just mentioning them and saying we help them solve a problem that you may also have found was pretty yeah. effective. And so then I started yeah. doing it the other way where I take a list of successful customers and start to just look on their connections and see who might be a good fit. So it's time consuming, but I found they were yeah. pretty good. Um, but isn't that why there are interns in the world? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. It was, it's, yeah. it's a process you could, your growth team or your, yeah, yep. your virtual assistant could help you um, build yep. those lists. Yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Go on Fiverr or something. You get that uh, really quick. That's an awesome tip. That, that's great. I love that. All right. Let's, uh, let's move on here. Um, and I'm going to ask just quickly go to the audience quickly because we do have some great questions. Thank you, everyone, for the, the ongoing uh, questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, Adam, there's one that's directly at you. Uh, I thought Drift alleviates the need for outbound, and now you guys are building an outbound team. What would you, what, what's your response there? Yeah, I don't think Drift um, would claim to alleviate the need for outbound, right? You still need to bring people into your website and make them aware of your business and, and proactively reach out to your best um, potential buyers. Where we come in and we're going to talk about messaging a little bit more is once you get some intent signals, once you have them on your website, that's where Drift really helps um, accelerate the sales process and you know make that engagement, kind of meet the buyer where they are with, with chat. Um, so I, I don't think we'd claim to sort of replace sales development, um, inbound or outbound, but we can help you engage with those high intent leads once you're on, once they're on the website and move them through the sales process more quickly. Yeah, that makes sense. And from my experience, so I've implemented drift in a, in a past role and we would see our, all our outbound efforts would, would drive the, the chat functionality, right? We could, we could do outbound campaigns that were much like kind of lighter and we were just driving people to the, to the website or some cool content or a landing page that we had. Uh, and then once they actually came there, uh, cause it's a much smaller call to action than, Hey, set up a meeting with me. Um, and then once they were on there, we could actually engage them and then, you know, bring them into the funnel that way. So I think they're very complimentary um, uh, rather than, you know, two different sides of the camp. So um, it's what people yeah, want. Absolutely. Um, all right, so we, we dove a little bit uh, into kind of LinkedIn. Um, so here's some more, more data that we have uh, around connection requests. Um, Trish, you wanna quickly run us through this? Yeah, so I was really surprised at this um, in that the bulk of people will, it says occasionally, but that's okay. We do most things occasionally, except yeah. connection requests from a sales rep. So what this says to me is that sales reps are getting really good at making customized or personalized LinkedIn requests to connect. Mm -hmm. It's a fabulous thing. We've been talking about that for a long time. What happens yeah. then though, is they don't know what to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. So once someone is, is your connection, you get to see, see what they're doing, it should end up in your stream and they get to see what you're doing. So really good marketing organizations are feeding their reps great content that can be delivered in a LinkedIn update so that this band of prospects that you're connected with, hopefully it'll show up in their stream because of their connection with you. And mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, just another channel to deliver that information to people and to start building your personal brand as an expert or as a person of value. So when the time is right, you can have that conversation and, and you've already established that empathy and credibility. Yeah, it's a great point. And it, it's funny, it's something, so we've got this marketing offsite this week and I was trying to put together some thoughts about, you know, why, building a brand even as a, a sales rep is so important. And Trish, I think you nailed it. It has nothing to do with, you know, that it's going to, you're going to close deals fast or anything like that. It's about building this new distribution channel that you don't have to rely on marketing. If you have a message that you want to get out a new feature, new functionality, new benefits, whatever it is, you can tactfully kind of, you know, put it into your messaging and it's just, it's a whole new distribution channel. That's not, reliant on marketing, which is, is very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Adam, did you, so you said you, you use social a lot as a, as a SDR. 
um, what was your kind of cadence of engagement when someone, you know, maybe the perfect, your ideal customer profile just accepts your, your LinkedIn request. It's so tempting to, you know, shoot them a note, but that's the cardinal okay. sin. What was your, what was your cadence of engagement? I totally agree with what you said there, which is just, it's using it as a distribution channel and staying top of mind. Um, I also, I would add to that one thing, which is using it as a, as a learning mechanism or a way to consume content, right? Because I think um, what I found is the smarter I was about my buyer that I was reaching out to and the industry, the better I could personalize my message and the more natural it would be to reach out. And I actually think that social is a two way street like that. When you're connected with lots of your prospects and customers, you get, information about what they're thinking about and you build empathy and then you also have a place to publish. So I thought of it that way. And when I would connect with somebody, I'd just be like, Hey, I think we're in the same space. We know some of the same people I'd love to connect and, and I'd love to connect here. I would never actually pitch them on LinkedIn. I would just then use that later in my cold email. So that was my approach. I don't know that that's right or wrong. That was just what I, what I uh, ended up doing there. I think it's a great approach. And, uh, We've, we've got some questions around this from, from the community, um, and I think we went over this a little bit, but um, Trish, do you feel it's absolutely mandatory to personalize the LinkedIn uh, connection request uh, if you're sending like a ton of them? Um, and at what point in the relationship should you request a connection? So let me start with that one. Um, I think you have to have told a little bit about your story before you send a connection request. So, you know, when we talk to people, we're like every touch in your omni-channel strategy, you have to consider it as a, as a book and every touch you're dropping a little chapter to that buyer. So I think before a buyer is going to say, yeah, I'm interested in maybe looking at your book um, they have to know what it's about. So I, I like LinkedIn requests three quarters of the way in to whatever your sequence or cadence is. So that's my personal opinion. From a personalization perspective, I, I personally don't upset, accept non-personalized LinkedIn requests. Um, and, but I will tell you, I have a client who is sending, now they sell to mid to low level IT security. They, they're sending blank connection requests and they're having a ridiculously high success rate Hmm. by doing nothing, but they're being smart about it. Yes, they're getting people to connect, but then they're using that channel to share information and not sell and not communicate one-to-one. They're building that channel to, to, broadcast one to many. So I think you got to look at your business, who you sell to and kind of once again, know your buyer and know their preferences. Mm -hmm. Curious in that case, what is the uh, persona that they're selling into? If you don't mind. It's like DevOps, DevOps managers. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. It's all roads back, all roads lead back to understanding your buyer, right? Rather than generalizing these things. Which I love, you know, and yeah. that's what it's all about. You know, it's so true, Adam, because so many people, you know, when they buy a fantastic sales engagement tool, they set up all these sequences, cadences, and they're so focused on how and when, but not with what. So I think that's mm-hmm. the thing for 2009. It's the with what part that we have to get specific about and not just the methodology, number of touches and all that good stuff. Right. I love that. Yeah, we get so obsessed with that, right? Because we, we even have activity metrics for the teams. And then it's kind of like, well, are we actually getting the, the with what right and, and the message and how we, how we deliver it? It's exactly. so important for, and it's, it's, yeah. I think it, we'll get into some of the email data, but we found clearly in analyzing a bunch of cold emails is that like results vary widely. There's no clear best practice of how long your subject line should be or how many touches I you should I wish there do. was. I wish there was. <laughs> it would make right. life easy, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do like email. I need, I, I think we all have a lot to learn about email. I think emails come, gone, back, down, up, sideways. So I, I'm really looking forward to your research on what you found when you analyze the emails. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And to that, 
to that point, like it's, it's so funny. So we do a lot of these sales hacker webinars and some of the most popular ones will be when you kind of allude to a fact that there's a silver bullet. Every salesperson on the planet oh, no. is looking for this silver bullet. And unfortunately, I get, I get personally asked this all the time, like what's one thing I can do? And it's, it's, there, there is nothing, unfortunately. It has try to harder. be, you know, try <laughs> harder, Hard be more fluid. Out as the silver bullet. <laughs> yeah, be, be more dynamic, be more fluid. You have to be a lifelong learner. Like that is, those are the, if there's a silver bullet, that's it. It's, yeah. It's never, A-B it's never test. stagnant. You have to. Yeah. A-B test. Yeah. yeah. Totally. Um, all right. So Adam, you are most definitely the, the expert in, in this field, uh, being, uh, you know, VP of, of strategy at Drift, you know, uh, biggest, you know, chat player in the game. So how will messaging and chat impact sales development in 2019? Cause I think we're just at like the tip of the, the mm-hmm. spear right now. And uh, totally. I think this will have game-changing qualities to the nature of the role. So I would love to to hear your your take on this. Totally, totally, yeah. And I think chat. What's what's happened with chat, you know, and live chat and in B two B, right? Is it's been around for support for a long time, right? Support mm-hmm. agents handling chats. But I think recently, in the last couple of years, it started to really rise in terms of sales. And when we say sales, we really mean sales development. I mean that's. That's who is doing chatting. That's where it makes the most sense in the sort of life cycle of a lead, of a buyer. Um, So this is some data from, we do a study of the Cloud 100 every year. And what we found is last year, about 15% of the Cloud 100 had, you know, messaging on their website. And and now it's 32%. So using them as sort of an early adopter pool to sort of show where some of the trends are going. I think broadly, it's not as well adopted, but growing really fast. if you want to flip to the next one, Scott, just a little thought here on, you know, how we see chat being part of modern sales development and more and more in 2019 is that um, this kind of craft of conversation development we see as as a third tool. If you've been you've gotten good at prospecting over email and the phone, you've started to use social selling, right? Those things are typically for when you ha- know somebody's a fit. Now, when you get intent and when you get them onto your website, when you get them engaging with your content and you get them clicking through on your emails, that's where being able to develop that conversation with live chat has a lot of value. Um, And it's a lower bar for the buyer, right? They just have to open the chat widget and they can fire questions. They can learn more. They can do it on their terms. So I think um, that's going to be a big part of sales development um, going forward as based on some of those trends we talked about with buyers. Uh, having more control and sort of wanting things on their terms. Yeah. Adam, I have a, a question for you on this. And it's something that I kind of struggled and went back and forth when we, uh, when I, I think I was a pretty early adopter of chat. And uh, we had our, our sales development team out there. It was an outbound team. So they were go, 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 sending lots of emails, lots of social touches, lots of phone. Um, and we had, we had chat as well. Do you, would you suggest that those outbound sales reps also take care of, of chat or would you have that as a separate role? Yeah. And we we're actually at drift developing a separate role internally that we'll call conversation development reps, which are really focused on inbound chat. So we think yeah. there's, there's a good business case to have a separate role when you have the volume. Um, but mm-hmm. in certain orgs where you have prospecting happen over a long life cycle, of a lead and where you know the outbound rep really owns that account um, we see it fitting in there too as long as you have kind of the you're able to like ring the bell when that person comes to the website so the right rep can can jump in and handle that then um, you know that can be part of the outbound workflow too so you know one of the great use cases that we're developing at drift with our outreach integration is when somebody clicks on an outreach email then being able to just have a welcome message that's personalized around the fact that they came through a cold email and being able to start a conversation and pick that up with the same person. So I think it's in both. When? Um, when? when? <laughs> yes, you're ready for it, Trish? I am. Soon. I'll get you a yeah. date. It's very soon. Yeah. It's, okay. it's coming. It's, it's coming pretty quick. Um, we- weeks, not that, months. That'll be so cool. Because that was, I think, that's kind of going to fix the piece that I remember a lot of my reps, they, they were like, no, you can't take this away from me because I was just doing a campaign into sports teams and now the sports team came in and it's like, uh, 
so it is this kind of this mixing, this blending. Uh, so totally. that's uh, and I think yeah. that's one cool. of the key differences between sales chat and support chat. Like support chat right. isn't built to do complex routing and ABM and targeting logic based on who the person is and where they are in the buyer cycle. Sales chat very much does those things. And so that's yeah. why um, I think we're seeing this become such a critical tool for sales development reps is because now you can chat with the people you want rather than just getting a bunch of noise to distract you from prospecting. Right. And yeah. Adam, I'm going to ask you another when question. Ready? Yes. So... Video is powerful. The buyer engagement study shows it's extremely powerful, depending on, once again, buyer preference. I heard that there's going to be a way for, to send someone a video, and then at the end, they can click and chat with you right then and there. Is you know, I think the win on some of that is already, at least from a drift point of view. Um, ah. I'm not sure how other, other platforms do it, but we have a Vidyard integration where you can drop a video into a chat. And then we also have with you, if you have Vidyard's premium you yep. know, licensing, when you send somebody a, one of your Vidyard links hosted on your domain, you can yep. have your chat widget there and have it say, you know, hey, do you want to talk more? So I think some of that's brilliant. already true today. That's brilliant. Yeah. It's just brilliant. It yep. is. It is. But I know that true. you're going to be Sorry. making more videos soon. So we have to figure out, we have to build this around your use case. <laughs> okay, dokey. Yeah. <laughs> I just want someone to call awesome. me. <laughs> Can we get someone, one of the SDRs, on this? Let's let's see some hustle here, and let's get Trish a phone call as we're on this webinar. There's quite mm -hmm. a few people well, they, on this webinar. Oh, you see, know what I realized? Though? I did. Copy of your book? I yeah, seriously. The, I will. I will send a free copy of my book to the person who figures out how to get me via mobile because I got rid of my landline, but my mobile number's out there. I'll tell, I'll tell you how too. I would prospect to you, Trish. <laughs> I would call you and leave you a voicemail saying, I just left a, uh, a great review of your book on Amazon and I'd love to uh, ask you <laughs> about the book. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I'd love to actually read it, so send it to me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, that's the two months of SDR work paying off for you, Adam. You, you've yeah. got all the answers. Um, all right. So, Adam, I know we've been doing some cool um, data research study all around cold emails. Uh, again, this is, this is kind of going back to that silver bullet uh, conversation. So many people are like, hey, send me your email templates. or like, what are you using? What works? Um, so... I'm excited to have this conversation. What are we learning right now about cold email as we head into 29, as security is tighter, as people's inboxes are getting busier and busier? As you said, you're now in this long queue of, of people, whether it's email, whether it's phone, whether it's LinkedIn messages. So uh, how do we combat this? Yeah. And this is just a preview into some of the work that we're doing, like uh, myself and, and Max on your team have been studying about 300 emails we got where we asked people to submit their winning their best emails and one of the big takeaways at first and Trish I'm curious what you think of what is good but we asked people to submit their good emails and this was just fascinating because what is good um, and they told us the open rate and the reply rate look how wide this distribution is you know everything from 100% mm -hmm. open and 80% reply down to just a couple percentage points um, I found this really fascinating just that we all have a different definition of what good is in email that probably varies by the type of buyer and industry and TAM and all these things. Um, but I thought this was a, one of the first things that stood out to us in the data. Yeah. Those people over on the right must all be billionaires with the, with the what is it? 80% or hundred percent open rate. That's crazy. Right. Yeah. Well, what so, you find with these is there are, there are emails that were used very little. Um, okay. That's, yeah, actually, if you go to the next page, I think that is one of the next yeah. slides, which is, you know, personalized emails sent to a small number of people, right? If your if your template isn't just something you're blasting out to everybody, but you're tailoring mm -hmm. it and you're hitting a specific segment with a very targeted message, like it works. The it's it's to your point, Scott. Like the silver bullet is kind of hard work, and um, yeah. doing things that, that would make your buyer. Uh, feel like they're a good fit and feel like they uh, would get value from engaging with you. Yep. Can we talk yeah. about open rates for a minute? Yes. Let's do it. Because 
Open rates, what do they really mean? Anybody, like I could roll past your email, never read it, and I would get an open rate. So I never mm -hmm. understood why people got so excited about open rate. The only, and mm -hmm. even reply rate, fantasy metric. Yes, Christian, you are correct. It's a fantasy metric. It's a vanity metric is what it is too. Um, yeah. But even the reply rate, it, that doesn't even matter to me unless you tell me positive versus negative. Is it like if I'm an SDR, am I, I guess even negative is positive in a way because then you know not to continue to pursue the person. But I think we need to change our metrics at some point. Yeah, I would agree. You can, I, I can get a 100% open rate by just doing a clickbaity subject line yeah. and then everyone reads it and doesn't like it. Or simply yeah. someone has the, the Gmail function that I have on where it shows the little preview and I didn't actually open your email. It's just how I read my emails and it comes up and it will show that it's, that it's open. So there's a lot of things that, that skew it. I think Trish, you're hundred percent right. You, you, we have to switch it to positive reply. That should be the, or negative. the all I mean, either, all. either way, because yeah. even negative is a good one to track because then, you know, maybe you need to change if you're A-B testing, you need to change your message or subject line, whatever. But I think we need to get to that level of dis disposition. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And, yeah. Yeah. So, Adam, we've got this really cool slide. So, this is, again, it's kind of the cool calling versus social selling. I know there's a lot of people that push for the automation side and just have everything running in the background. And then when someone, you know, opens it, then call them. Uh, or there's the camp of like hyper personalization where you're crafting an email for, for like an hour and you've done all this research and it's the most beautiful thing ever. Uh, and you, you pray that uh, the email doesn't bounce. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, so walk us through this, uh, you know, automation versus personalization and how you, you saw it kind of affect yeah. uh, open and reply rates. Yeah. And again, we're using what I agree are flawed metrics on, on open rate. And, and I think reply rate is still a good proxy for engagement. Obviously it doesn't capture everything. Like if they, if they clicked and then opened a live chat, that would be just as good as a reply. Like we're trying to use this as a proxy for positive engagement. Mm -hmm. Um, but the big takeaway here is just if you're looking at very, very high reply rates, like 20% plus, most of those dots are pink. And, you know, I, I'd say that the other side of this is there is hope, right? That we do see people sending automated templates out that are getting very, very high response rates, um, but it's, it's less common. So it kind of goes to the, the hypothesis that if you, if you do personalization, if you, if you t segment your audience, um, you will see better engagement. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. And be wary of best practices. I like this one. I've always said best, as soon as something is a best practice, it's going to get saturated and it's no longer going to be a best practice because everyone is doing it. Um, like being chased by an alligator or falling under a file <laughs> cabinet or, all, yes. or the breakup <laughs> email or yeah. 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 Totally. Yeah, I was hoping for a silver bullet here when we, when we looked at subject lines and body length and word counts and you words versus me words, so slice the data a bunch of different ways. And um, I'd say just one thing that was clear in a lot of those slices is you have, you have emails that break the mold that are very effective and you have ones that do the, the best practice and don't work at all, um, which, which isn't surprising, but it just, it, it was a good reminder that you know, you can do things different and, and, and still get exceptional results. And, and perhaps even that's a good way to go about things is, is try to be different to Trisha's point. How do you stand out? Um, yeah. I saw someone do something interesting recently and I hope they don't, I'm not going to call them out because then other people might start doing it. They're competitors. <laughs> I want them to have the advantage, but <laughs> a local Boston based company, it came to my attention that in their text based emails, they were sending, instead of embedding a link, they were sending the full boat URL, like almost like a, a paragraph. Mm. And their click-through rates were higher by doing that than when they embedded the link. And I don't know if people are like, oh, I don't have to worry about it being spam. Or, or I don't know why people would do that, but mm. they are. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. It is. Definitely, Maybe because it's different. Definitely counter... 
counterintuitive. Yeah. And it right? could simply be the fact that everyone is used to seeing, you know, things that are embedded. And, and when you see that, you're like, oh, that's weird. And it's bigger. Like, it takes up more space. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it was. I thought it was really interesting. All right. So we have five minutes for a, a little Q&A. We have tons of great questions. And I've got a few of them um, here. I can't see all of them. So Adam and Trish, if you see any good ones on there, uh, feel free to, to call them out. Um, there, there's one here addressed at me, which I'll quickly go. Scott, can you speak to LinkedIn pitching being a cardinal sin or sending the first connection message being a sin? I let that drop and didn't say anything about it. Um, f for me, I think if you do a, a good enough job of getting someone you know, who fits your ideal customer profile to accept mm -hmm your LinkedIn request, the worst thing you could possibly do is turn around and kind of break their trust and pitch them right away. I think we've all been there. Trish, this has happened to you a million times. Adam, I'm sure it's happened to you a million times. And you kind of just feel, you feel duped. Do you feel like they just, because everyone knows if you're a sales rep that that's kind of your intention, but take me out for a coffee first kind of thing, <laughs> you know, like show me that you're, you're valuable through the content that you're putting out. And then maybe down the road, we can have a discussion if it's warranted. So that's why I, I look at it as kind of the cardinal sin. Cause you're actually, you're actually hurting that relationship. Um, you, like you're basically burning a bridge if you do that. Um, can I, any, any thoughts on that? No, I mean, I think it's, it's like, nothing's more annoying. Nothing is more annoying. Nothing yeah. is more, nothing guarantees you more that I'm never going to ever talk to you than <laughs> thank you for connection. And then, and they're long. Not only are you yeah, annoying, sometimes. but you're wordy because they're always long with links and links and the calendars. And I'm like, hey, sure. Okay. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, Scott. Yeah. Shannon Carabetta, Shannon, you see my email address right there. Send me your mailing address and I will send you a copy of my book. You get an A for effort. Oh, no way. She called you? She called my 888 number. I just looked over on my phone and I saw it and I'm like, I got <laughs> someone who figured that out. She said she couldn't find my mobile, but I give her an A for effort. Oh, uh, that's amazing. Shout out, Shannon. Good job. That's yep. awesome. Yep. Um, all right, so let's um, – just trying to find – we probably have time for one um, question. Uh, this is an interesting one. It, uh, what do you think about outsourcing the SDR function? It's a big topic right now, too. It's probably a separate yeah. webinar, but it's a good one. Trish, yeah. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, that's a business I used to be in, right? So – I do believe in it. If your company doesn't have the bandwidth, the expertise, or, and this is the big one, the passion to build a sales development team, then don't go find a partner to do it with you. And I mean, people have come so far. This isn't telemarketing anymore. There are totally professional organizations that do a fabulous job with this. So I think it's a completely viable option. Hmm. I don't that know. really hit me, Trish. Yeah. Cause I think it's like, if you're going to commit to learning the craft, and teaching it and building it as a as part of the core of your business, then I think it makes a lot of sense to do it in-house. But if you're not, then there are some great shops that really know the, the playbook and can probably help you and do a better job if you're not really going to commit to it. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My my quick two cents on that is I, d I don't even think it's a an either or. You know, I, marketing outsources so many things. You use creative agencies. You do all this stuff when you don't have the bandwidth to get everything done. Uh, I think having a complementary outsource team, again, going back to A-B test it, see if it works. Are they performing better? If they are, why? Learn from them. Uh, I think it can be complementary there. Um, all right. So as we wrap up, so uh, these emails, best way to get a hold of you. Uh, LinkedIn, a good channel as well. Uh, Twitter, Absolutely. you guys are just throwing everywhere. Yeah. Awesome. And Adam, just for those people who maybe have been living under a rock and do not know what drift is, um, how are you helping sales and marketing professionals today? Yeah. So drift is the leading conversational marketing platform, which means 
We have um, chat bots that can work on your website to start conversations with visitors. And then we have a live chat solution for sales development reps to pick up and develop those conversations into meetings. So we have kind of an end-to-end -end experience of engaging visitors when they're on your site and converting those to meetings. So the whole idea is that it speeds up the sales cycle and meets your buyers where they are. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, Trish, how is the Bridge Group helping sales professionals uh, in, in 2019 and beyond? So we're working with B2B tech companies, sales development, inside sales, and 2019 is the year that we go public with our customer success um, service offering because customer success, cool. the revenue generation side of the house is going to become even more critically important once we figure out how to keep our customers and uh, expand yep. their lifetime value. So we're expanding into that. Really excited about it. We're going to continue to do our research like we always do, share it with the community. And yeah, we're excited. It's going to be a great year. Love it. I'm implementing. I'm excited for 2019 and I'm with you. I think we saw like this explosion of like MarTech and, and people focusing on mar marketing and then sales kind of has its, its time right now. And I think customer success is, is coming up. More people are, are paying attention to it. So yep. I'm with there with yep. you there. And right. uh, Adam, One Trish, Austin, yes. Then Austin, send me an email. Yes. That's the number you did it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Got it. Two people. Got it. I'm proud of the sales hack community today. Well done. I love yeah. it. Well, thank you everyone for, for spending the, the hour with us. Sorry for the technical difficulties at the beginning. Trish and Adam, thank you so much for your insight. I it's been fun lot. hanging out with you. I learned a lot. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Me too. Thanks, I always do. Thanks, Trish. Thanks community. Right. Well, take care. Okay.